When I was young, I was into anything unexplained, including Bigfoot, UFOs, Nessie, the Bermuda Triangle, etc. So I've always had an open mind about unexplained things. An odd connection to that interest was being raised in a Christian household. My father is a pastor and holds very deep and committed beliefs in what is written in the Bible. My brothers and I were taught from a very young age that things exist beyond our normal perception and that mainstream society would actively try to dismiss things such as miracles and healing or anything science could not explain. That belief also extended to spirits, demons, possession, and other things mentioned in the Old Testament. I mention this because the beliefs in anything Christian-based and cryptic are not often associated. However, even as a child, it made me open to the idea of things that mainstream society doesn't believe in can exist, and that it might be in modern science's best interest to dismiss the idea of such things since they cannot be explained by any current knowledge. The reason for this would be that modern science has be seen as having all the answers and cannot be questioned. I was also instilled with a distrust of authority as an entity and consensus as a barometer of truth and was encouraged to look for the truth myself. We were taught to keep an eye out for when lies might be more convenient than facts. That fostered a constant sense of existence of truth outside the textbook and in an awareness of suppression of thought, but also helped keep my mind open to all kinds of things, spiritual and otherwise. We did not, however, believe in Santa, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny or other cartoonish things, even within our realm of belief, there were firm limits. Some may associate any belief in God as the same as belief in Santa, however this seemed to foster in me an openness to the unknown without believing for the sake of novelty and focus towards what evidence does exist. People don't write books and have conferences about the existence of Santa, as far as I know. By the time this happened to me, I was well open to the idea of UFOs and believed in the existence of Bigfoot. However, I never believed I would ever see one. In fact, I'm not even sure I wanted to at the time, or now. In my teenage years, I was busy with sports, music, and girls, and I had put my interest in the unknown in the back of my head, until one weekend in 1995 or 96. I am recalling this as best as my memory serves. I lived in very rural southwest Colorado at the time, in a town small enough that I could walk out my back door with a fishing pole and a rifle, and hike around and nobody would say a word. I won't mention the name because the town is small enough someone could probably find out who I am just by knowing where that I lived there. The area itself has tons of deer and elk in town, and sometimes had issues with mountain lions that would move into town and take livestock and other small pets. A little further outside of town, we would see bears, and there are large areas of unoccupied forest nearby. I mention this to establish that, while I live and have lived in big cities for a good chunk of my life, I also have spent plenty of time in the rural areas and wilderness, hunting, fishing, and camping. I have an uncle that lives in Denver. And at the time, he and his then wife had bought a cabin outside of Fairplay, 
which is where the old town of South Park City is. The area is called South Park, as a park is a flat area or valley of high elevation in a mountain range. In order to get there from Denver, you drive through places like Breckenridge, the ski resort town, to give you an idea of what the terrain was like. There are large swatches of national forest connecting around mountain peaks and areas where people either cannot access or rarely set foot. The cabins in the areas were really just modern houses built out in the woods with a bit of rustic but modern amenities. There were other houses within eyesight of his cabin and the town was not too far away. So the area was sparse, but not completely isolated by any means. There were large fields of open ground, but the houses were built very close to thick forests that go up to the nearby mountains. One would simply have to cross a two-track dirt road, and you would be in a forest where you could walk in a straight line for miles without seeing any sign of a human. This cabin had a large wood patio around the back and down one side. Large glass windows in the living room facing the forest. The downstairs bathroom, the one we would primarily use, had semi-obscured glass blocks as a wall that faced the forest as well. There were motion sensor lights around the house and other modern amenities. The house was two-story with one of the upstairs rooms having windows that faced a thicket of pine and aspen trees that was actually about 10 to 15 feet high as the ground sloped away from the house on that side. I was 16 or 17 at the time and still in high school. Over the 4th of July weekend, my uncle invited some family and friends up to the cabin, just for a few days. We arrived right at dusk, a few days before the 4th. It was my mom and dad, my younger brother, two cousins, and two aunts and uncles, all sharing the house for the holiday. As soon as I got out of the car, I felt a massive uneasiness come down on me like a blanket. I honestly felt scared or in danger like I had suddenly stepped into a bad neighborhood. While I was trying to process this feeling and how out of place it was in the woods, I noticed my little brother seemed a bit jittery too, so I asked if he could feel that. He said he did. When I asked him what he thought it was, he whispered, Bigfoot, as if the word came out of him before the thought was actually in his head. Hearing him say what I was thinking made me shudder, and my hair raised on the back of my neck. We got the luggage in the house as fast as we could, with me looking over my shoulder at the tree line the whole time, but also trying to act normal. The adults were busy greeting each other and did not act like anything was wrong. However, I felt like I needed to at least reach the light of the porch as soon as possible, or something bad was going to happen. That night, everything was uneventful, with the parents talking late and us kids all in sleeping bags open on the living room floor. I'm pretty sure I fell asleep while the adults were still up, and being inside with them around felt safe. But I still felt very afraid about what might be outside the house. The next morning we got up, ate, and did the typical family gathering bathroom rotation. Some of the adults went on a hike. The weather was beautiful. The sky was clear and all the sense of unease was gone completely. The area was simply gorgeous. My brother and I talked a little bit about what we had said the night before 
and I think we both felt a bit foolish about being so afraid. Since there was nothing else to do, we set up about exploring around the area with the loose goal of finding some kind of Bigfoot evidence. My cousin was primarily a big city kid, but when we told him what we were about, he was in too. In the back of my head, I had remembered some signs to look for, whether from a book or one of the few TV specials that were put out at the time. This was a time before anyone had talked about tree knocks or howling, so we stuck to looking for large animal signs. We found some odd things that morning. I spotted where leaves and bark were worn off the trees about six to eight feet up. We found some small structures and oddly placed sticks and earth, and also some saplings that had been all twisted up. Probably the most significant thing we had found was a mature aspen on its side that had been completely uprooted in the middle of a grove of other unharmed trees. There were no signs of digging or other tools, and no rot of the tree itself. Even at my young age, I could conclude that it could not have been wind or some kind of mechanical force that would have caused this without there being any damage to the rest of the trees. Their shape was too tight to allow a backhoe or truck through without scraping up the other trees. That summer had been dry, so there were no footprints or other clear signs, however. There was certainly nothing I could show an adult without sounding a little nutty, so we kept our investigation to ourselves. Most of the things we found were relatively close to the house. I'm not sure the age of the neighborhood, but I knew the houses hadn't been there very long, and the area was slowly being developed, but was still very close to large areas of uninhabited forest. Late that morning, I took a nap outside in a hammock. The breeze was perfect. There were wildflowers blooming. It was peaceful and quiet, with the exception of one of the neighboring cabin's dogs I could hear once in a while. We ate hot dogs, threw a football, and had a great, typical summer day. After a while, I forgot what I had felt the night before. That lasted until the early afternoon, just as the sun started to get close to the mountains on the horizon. Almost like a moving fog, the sense of unease and dread came back as strong as I felt the night before. I fought with myself a bit, trying to shake the feeling off, and telling myself I was being irrational and weak, but I couldn't rid myself of the feeling and did not feel relief until I was back in the house. I was flat out afraid of what was out there, and it felt like it was not only aware, but interested in us. We spent the rest of the afternoon playing music upstairs, as my cousin and I played guitar and bass together and had brought our instruments. We even wrote a goofy, childish song that I could still remember and can play to this day. The guitar riff isn't bad, but I've grown out of the lyrics comparing the past to dirty underwear. Ha <laughs> ha. Looking back, it's still strange the way things felt. Inside the house were surrounded by adults and light and laughter, so I would forget what I was feeling. Then I'd be alone for a minute or step outside to get something from the car and be reminded again immediately. I know I did a good job hiding it because, years later, when I told the people that were there what we saw, nobody had any idea we were afraid at all. That evening, we drove into town and rented a movie, Vertigo if I recall correctly, and ate dinner as a group. Some of the food prep was going on outside on the grill, but I don't know how to tell my dad or uncles that I was afraid for them and that they seemed to notice nothing at all. After dinner, 
Some wine and beers were out along with dessert, and we put on a little concert for the adults, including the debut of our underwear song. Things were fine until the adults all trickled off into their rooms, and I was left with my brother and cousin in the living room, with its large windows and very thin curtains. I was having a hard time sleeping, though my brother and cousin didn't. My brother could fall asleep anywhere and sleep through anything. Sometime in the middle of the dead calm night, the motion sensor lights came on with a barely audible click. There was no sound, no wind, and even the neighbor's dog, which had been loud all day, was dead silent. After a few intense minutes, they turned off. Then came on again, and again. I did not dare peek out the windows, but I could picture a giant hairy creature walking on two legs around the porch, trying to look in. With only a thin piece of glass and a white sheet of fabric separating us, I pretty much did not sleep that night. I was about six foot and 165 pounds, almost a full grown adult. Yet here I was in a secure house with six adults under the same roof, but as scared as a baby, wishing one of them was in the room with me. The fear was almost paralyzing. I wouldn't even use the bathroom because I was worried I would see something through the decorative glass blocks that I could not unsee. The next morning was the fourth, and everything felt fine again, but I knew that would not last. We poked around outside some more, but I really did not want to stray too far from the house now. We saw a few more things, but nothing significant. The day was very cloudy and cold, with the heat and threat of a heavy thunderstorm that might hit any time typical unpredictable summer mountain weather. That afternoon, some people showed up for a party, but rain came very heavy off and on and prevented any fireworks. However, there were strange things happening around the house. A few of the visitors brought their dogs and my uncle and his wife's two dogs, who happened to live harmoniously together for quite a long time had a severe fight out of nowhere. My uncle had to hit his dog over the head with a shovel just to get her to go let go of the other dog. It was a sort of traumatic event that I never experienced since we didn't have dogs growing up, with people crying and yelling. I heard someone say there was dominance issues between the two dogs just due to the presence of another but I felt there was another tension in the air they could sense that was causing them to act strange. They never once fought before. Around the time when the dogs had their altercation, the feeling returned so heavily I was about to crawl out of my skin. So I asked my brother and cousin if they wanted to go hang out inside the cabin. With the threat of the storm and the dogs fighting, everything felt off and tense, like something dark was pressing down on me. This time it felt more acute, while before it had only been more of a vague sense. I felt like something was close by. We borrowed some binoculars and decided to go to the room upstairs just to see what we could see in the forest from the window. I felt a little more secure up high and out of reach. I tried to pinpoint a direction from where the feeling was coming from and focused the binoculars on that area in the trees. I was zoomed in, moving the binoculars around and trying to focus on anything odd that I could see. I began to focus the lens on one aspen when I noticed I was seeing a dark shape behind it. All at once, my eyes and brain reconciled what I was focusing on. Matted fur, with sticks and leaves stuck to it, the shape of a shoulder. And then it moved. 
I almost dropped the binoculars, and my heart was beating out of my chest as I shuddered. I just saw a Bigfoot! I began shaking and had never felt so much fear in my life. My head was spinning, still trying to figure out what I knew I had seen. My brother and cousin both took a turn looking through the binoculars immediately after me, as I wouldn't even put them back up to my eyes again. At first, they both acted like I was playing a prank, but both of them soon were as white as I was. My cousin said he was looking directly into a face with a skin texture similar to a gorilla. He said it was almost as if it, they made eye contact through the binoculars, and the eyes were empty and emotionless, and that made him more afraid. My brother said he saw a side profile as the creature had turned to look out into the clearing. He also described a gorilla-like profile, but he had no doubt what it was, and he also had no doubt he was interested in us. We actually shut the blinds and did not go downstairs for some time until we could act normal again. It still amazes me in the situation that I saw what I believed could have been proof of the existence of Bigfoot. It was within a hundred yards of the house, yet I didn't do anything to get concrete evidence. I could have told my uncle or dad or asked to borrow a camera because my uncle is a photographer, but the fear was just so overwhelming. I couldn't even think of looking at it again much less venturing into the woods after it. In the moment, processing the information almost makes it feel like your mind is splitting because your eyes are seeing something and communicating that something back to the brain. But the brain is telling the eyes to look again because that doesn't fit with what the brain knows should or should not exist. I partially think some of the fear was just fear of the unknown. I don't have any idea if the creature would have snatched one of us or even done anything at all besides observe us, but I somehow knew it was aware that we knew it was there. We also knew that it knew it could destroy us if it chose to. We all left the cabin the next morning and I remember feeling a great sense of relief leaving the area. It was years before I talked to any adults on the trip about what we saw. I told my dad about it late at night on another road trip across Colorado. He didn't say whether he believed me or not, but he said he felt there was so much wilderness in the US that it was conceivable to him that a North American ape could exist, yet elude mankind. My uncle, who I told years later, said he wished I'd told him so he could have started looking because he hiked and fished around there all the time. He said he felt he missed out on not being aware that something might have been in the area. They sold the cabin years ago, but in the last few years there have been many sightings in the area. There were prints casted about a mile or two from the cabin near a four mile creek on the back side of Pikes Peak. So sightings are frequent in the area, and we are not the only ones to have seen something nearby. Now that the internet has made it available for more people to communicate their personal stories, I feel much more confident telling my story. The behavior patterns seem to fit, with the creature being interested in the only kids at the house, and not seeming to pay any attention to the adults. I'm not sure why none of the adults could feel it, but I still get hairs on the back of my neck standing up just thinking about it. I never felt the fear that potent, yet I didn't necessarily feel threatened directly, just scared of something huge that was aware of me and could have kidnapped me if it wanted to. I also attributed the uneasiness that I didn't feel in the morning, but coming on into the afternoon to the sleep pattern of that particular Bigfoot, and it possibly watching us out of curiosity in the afternoon, and even into the evening. I have been in the woods plenty of times since, but I am still haunted by what I saw, 
and have to make a serious effort to not think about it when I am out, or else the fear can still paralyze me all these years later. Somehow, knowing it exists, yet so many people not believing it, generates even more fear. From a certain perspective, ignorance can be bliss. On the other hand, I like living in a world where mysteries still exist, and science is not as settled as they portray.